Welcome back, Cab Troopers, future scout pilots. Hey, uh, it's Berendus, part three, uh, in a, I guess, now multi-part series of the uh, detailed introduction to the KW. Um, so in this part, what I'm going to do is take us from where we left off in part two, which I believe was uh, just before flipping the bat switch to battery and getting the aircraft uh, run up through idle and uh, then up to 100% get all the uh, systems online and we'll see how far we get. I tend to get bogged down in minutia. Um, some of you guys love that apparently. Uh, so, you know, I'll kind of continue that, that paradigm. Um, but it tends to make these things pretty long. So, you know, I don't know how long you can sustain interest in an hour long video of me talking about uh, bells and whistles and whatnot, but hey, uh, We'll see where this goes. Uh, if, if there's a part four and a part five, it'll be, you know, running up through the pages, getting some of the systems online, uh, going through some of the checklist items for configuring radios, etc. Now, we may just save some of that for when we're closer to release, which is a nice segue uh, and a disclaimer, I guess. So the first thing I want you guys to know is I don't know when this is going to be released. Uh, you, I am not a representative or employed by polychop i'm just a subject matter expert part of a team of former kw pilots of various flavors so i happen to be standardization um, or instructor pilot and we got a maintenance test pilot on the team a um, couple other uh, stands and what we call regular line pilots and uh, and a very experienced experienced uh, technical inspector TI uh, on the maintenance side. So if there's ever a question as I go through these things and we find some stuff and quite honestly, I'm dredging through the bottom pits of my, you know, brainstem and memory cells, uh, digging some of this information up. Uh, whenever I have a question, I turn the maintainers as far as systems wise, because uh, one of them, uh, you know, he's got some books squirreled away from when he first started doing this uh, a long, long time ago, and those guys can uh, chase sparks and wires and diagrams, et cetera, and generally figure out what we're trying to get after. Um, so back to the point, um, we uh, do not represent Polychop, but we are helping them get the details right. So you can be very assured that there is a keen interest on our part to uh, get this thing looking and flying right and what you will see as the end product is as close as we can get it to uh, actuality and reality um, within the within the limits of DCS. So I'm no coder, uh, but I know that uh, DCS was really not intended um, with rotary wing aerodynamics in mind. And as I understand it, it's quite a challenge. And uh, there's a lot of systems and a lot of uh, dynamic things happening uh, in rotary wing aerodynamics that maybe sometimes are quite a quite a challenge when you try to transpose that from something that was designed to replicate fixed wing aerodynamics which in comparison are really quite simple uh, to what's going on in rotorcraft and the various um, kind of conditions that we encounter as we go from hover to uh, slow slow flight to fast flight etc the bottom line is what you're seeing is uh, what we think is right. So I, I just want to put that assurance out there. Uh, some of you had questions. Uh, I know that there, uh, I don't know, from what I've been reading, there's um, a little bit of uh, historical dissatisfaction with the flight model in the Gazelle. I don't know. I've never flown it. Uh, so I really have no basis of comparison. Um, but what we're doing here is... Uh, from the bottom up trying to make the this thing fly right and look right and the systems work right and me and the the team of kw enthusiasts are helping pc you know work on those aspects of it to get it right my intent for these videos is to number one uh, just kind of generate a little bit of enthusiasm uh, i do not know when the expected release date is it's still some time off you know pc says it's uh sometime in 2020 which probably feels pretty realistic to me because there's still some things we need to iron out as far as the uh what what's happening behind the computers and behind the screen so to speak and 
and how the uh, MFD pages interact with each other and getting some of the functional components of uh, the weapon systems, etc., working together, um, lasing, etc. So those are all still works in progress. Also, what you see in front of you is clearly is a work in progress. It's an alpha or maybe a beta. Uh, so the final product that you'll see at the end of all this uh, may be slightly different than than this. So these videos are not intended as you know instructional as part of the release. It's just kind of uh, my take on um, providing information to the community and fan base out there that are interested in the KW because uh, you know me and the team of uh, subject matter experts are. Uh, very enthusiastic about this aircraft. We love to fly it. Um, we love the culture that it was part of uh, in the cavalry. And uh, quite honestly, we're happy to um, sort of provide that information and enthusiasm to the rest of the world out there. So that's what I'll do with these videos. Um, second, uh, like I was saying, I'm not a professional YouTuber. Um, I've got a little cheesy mic in front of me and uh, basically all I do is turn on DCS uh, hit record and start talking it's completely unscripted I don't know what I'm gonna say uh, I try to follow kind of the flow of the checklist and then uh, you know as my eye catches something I'll talk about it you may hear me say a lot of ums and uhs and you know not sound very professional hey I'm it is what it is so as I go through this and kind of dive down the rabbit hole sometimes uh, like I'm doing now, um, I may have to just backtrack. Uh, and then if I find some errata or something that isn't quite right as far as the coding aspect, you know, I'll call it out and uh, we will capture that uh, as something to fix uh, as we go through our builds. Okay, so that's uh, seven minutes of just preamble right there. So let's get back to the meat of this. Um, I left off in part two with uh, on the checklist just before uh, turning the battery switch to battery. Okay, so what I'm going to do real quick in more of a real time aspect is just a quick review of going through steps one through four. So, um, you know, as we climb in, I'll, I'll get into step one. So, seatbelt, shoulder harness, inertia reel, fasten and check. This would be a call out. So, like I was saying, I'd check my, my belts, give them a tug, check the uh, uh, inertia reel release handle. Okay, so both left and right seat are secure. We'll move on to step two, overhead panel equipment and switches, check and set. Okay, so this is where I start back here. Uh, the first item in the detail procedure is check the utility light. We're not going to bother with it. We're not going to use it. Then I move over to the aft, overhead cir or the, uh, aft center circuit breaker panel. Uh, basically everything is going to be in and down except for these particular items. Particle separator is going to be out. L2 mum is down. Uh, radar detector, which is the APR44, no longer installed. Nothing connected to this switch. Radar warning is the APR39 and ANAVR2 laser detector set. That's going to come on. IFF is going to be turned off and the old high frequency uh, switch that radio no longer installed, now repurposed to the BFT, the Blue Force Tracker System, is going to be off. Moving to my AUX circuit breaker panel, my CMOS, I'm going to turn off. And then I can move to my uh, aft overhead circuit breaker panel. So everything in here should be in. Moving to uh, my switches on the forward overhead circuit breaker panel. Ignition and FADEC come on. All other circuit breakers are in. I'm not worried about my lighting rheostats since we're not flying at night. I forgot to mention over here my MVG formation lights I really don't care about for nighttime, so not to break the flow of this up. Any collision light per the checklist is going to come on. That's a safety feature. I don't care about my navigation uh, and position lights, nor my interior cockpit lighting. The auto compartment blower switch uh, for hot days, I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. And then the uh, defog blowers I don't need on the windscreens, my heater and my pedo heater. Uh, conditions don't warrant turning those on don't need it engine auto oil bypass uh, in combat I would go ahead and flip this on um, really it's kind of user preference per the checklist it's off in normal operations if we're flying into uh, where we think we might get shot I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on engine anti-ice we don't need and fuel boost for the start we're gonna 
leave that off and I explained what's going on there uh, in part two. All other switches, battery, DC, AC, and essential bus will be off. I move to my fuel valve handle. I just kind of give this a tug, make sure that it's firmly seated in the detent and that it cannot be pulled to the rear inadvertently. I check my free air temperature, which uh, as the other day is probably 22 degrees, which it is. Okay, and the reason I want to know that is it has some, uh, some bearing on my performance criteria when I do some performance checks. Okay, that is the, gosh dang it. Uh, overhead panel equipment and switches check and set. I then move on to step three, instrument panel instruments and switches check and set. Okay, so I start in the middle. Now, the CMOS and the SATCOM have separate callouts in the checklist, but since we're, uh, they were at components that were added later, so they're kind of out of sequence uh, logically. Um, so we can look at these now. I know that uh, my CMOS control head is going to be off. And from there, sorry, I keep turning the checklist on. I got a little fumble finger with my mouse. Uh, I move to my RFD. I'm looking for static indications and that everything appears to be normal. And that's kind of everything that I'm doing here. There's not a whole lot of switches to set. I'm just looking to make sure that everything appears normal. So my RFD uh, is installed, no cracks. Uh, my VSIs, vertical scale instruments. Um, Static indications, um, properly installed, no cracks in the in the glass or the bezels. My MFD, a couple of things to note here. So I'm looking for condition security, cleanliness, etc. Et uh, my knobs here are important, uh, and I did not talk about these in, in part two, so I'll go ahead and cover them now. Primary and backup indicates which feed, um, where how the electrons are flowing from the MCPUs. Uh, so this needs a, a little bit of explanation. There's, there are two computers in the aircraft that control everything. They're called MCPUs, Master Controller Processor Units. Um, there's a left and a right. They both have redundant and overlapping features. However, they also have some non-overlapping features. The Master Master Controller Processor Unit is the left one. If that one fails, um, the right one cannot reset the left one. If the right one fails, the left can reset the right one. That's very confusing. Uh, the way the MFDs work is that they are cross-wired. Uh, so the left MCPU controls the correction. The right MCPU controls the left seater's screen, and the right uh, and the left MCPU controls the right seater screen. And if what I just said didn't make sense, just they're cross-wired. Left controls right. Right controls left. All right, so if one of those uh, computers fails, you're going to lose the screen on the opposite side of the cockpit. The primary and backup um, button here will basically just transfer the feed from that, or to that screen, I should say, um, to the other uh, master controller processor. So in other words, if I lose my left MCPU, I'm going to get all kinds of caution and warnings because a lot of other systems failed with it. A lot of critical components. It's a that is a uh, that's a critical emergency, and the emergency procedure for that is land as soon as possible. Um, so I will lose all indications and function on this screen. What I can do then is hit backup, and all that happens is that whatever the left seater has displayed on his screen will be mirrored over here. So they will just be showing the same thing. Normally, they can be run completely independently. So the left seater can be, you know, looking at his HSD or his MMS page or his comms page or wherever he's buried in the screens, and the right seater can leave his VSD up, his flight information, and uh, work independently. If one of those MCPUs fails, the backup then is to just switch this switch, um, rotate this knob to the backup position, and then both screens will be showing the same thing from the remaining good MCPU. So for the startup, I just want to make sure that I'm in primary so that I have the, the proper uh, connection to the, to the MCPU that's controlling that screen. Manual MVG for daytime, you know, basically all this does is change it from, from white lettering to green lettering. The white lettering is less compatible with the wavelengths that the MVGs are sensitive to, so it tends to bloom out. If you were to look through the tubes at the screen under the white lettering, it will appear very bright. 
You can't read anything anyways because MBGs are not focused inside the cockpit. They are focused to infinity. So whenever you're looking at any instrumentation in the cockpit while wearing goggles, you're looking underneath them as if you were, you know, kind of peering underneath binoculars that you held, uh, that you had up to your face. So if you can imagine sitting in your car with, now, MBGs don't magnify anything except light. Uh, the image is not any, it's, it's real sized, um, but they are focused out to infinity. So we did not look at our cockpit instrumentation through the tubes. You have to look underneath the tubes and then look at your cockpit through the naked eye. Nevertheless, anything that's any lighting that is not NVG compatible, uh, particularly red wavelengths, um, will tend to bloom out or overpower the MVGs. So uh, all our Army helicopters have MVG compatible cockpits, which generally is lighting in the blue green wavelengths. In the old days before MVGs, uh, cockpit lighting used to be red. And that's because the human eye is far more sensitive to red wavelength light than it is to blue-green light. Uh, so anything that's in the red spectrum, the human eye is actually very, very sensitive to. And so it's more appropriate to have red lighting, for instance, in your car, the dashboard light, uh, when you're driving at night, typically is going to be um, red. Anything in the blue-green spectrum, the human eye is not so sensitive to. There's a lot of backstory on why they chose blue-green as the color um, to be displayed in NVGs. A lot of it has to do with the type of phosphors and materials that they could, uh, that the technology and chemistry allowed at the time, and then it just kind of became tradition. That's changing now. They've got some NVGs that are uh, in the grayscale wavelengths, and there's some that are in the yellow scale wavelengths. So as the technology uh, is improving, uh, cockpit lighting may change, but just in general, anything that's MVG compatible is blue-green. So when you flip this knob to MVG, it, all it does is change the background or the lettering uh, to sort of a darker green color. And when I turn the cockpit instrumentation on, everything has a, has a green or a blue-green wavelength so that it doesn't overpower the MVGs when you're trying to look through them. All right, that's a lot of talking just to talk about uh, a very simple feature. I then move to my clock. Uh, no power, don't see anything. I just want to make sure it's there and it looks normal. Same thing with the APR39 display. Uh, no cracks and everything appears normal. My heater over temp indicator and my EBF or engine barrier filter bypass button should be there. Uh, again, everything looks normal. Then I move to my mag compass. Uh, that should have fluid in there and you know I give it a tap to make sure it's not stuck, etc. I then move to my uh, MFD aux uh, panel, which has my um, turn and slip indicator. Uh, so this should, this has fluid in it, and it's a ball that's free to move in there, and it indicates whether I'm flying in trim or not. So a good pilot always strives to be in trim. It's real easy to tell when you're flying doors off whether you're out of trim or not, uh, because you won't be able to hear your co-pilot because your mic is just uh, <laughs> uh, being overpowered by the wind noise. So that's how you can always kind of tell a new pilot whether he's flying in or out of trim. Uh, this is backed up once I turn, once we get the flight instruments up on, on the MFD, there's an electronic backup to this. Uh, it, it's really user preference which one um, guys like to use. Uh, I tell you, I usually, it, when I was sitting in the right seat, always flew with the, with the kind of the standard traditional instrument. From there, um, I can set my vent knob pulls, then I move to my standby instruments. Uh, so, Particularly for the altimeter, there is no primary and backup altimeter system. It's all run off the same pitot-static system. So the standby and what is displayed on the MFDs comes off the same pressure system in the aircraft. Just if your MFDs fail, uh, this instrument will still work, but there's no you know, primary and backup pitot-static system in the aircraft. There's only one, and both instruments run off the same one. Nevertheless, I check to make sure that everything looks normal here. Static indications on the instruments. I should have my off flag on my attitude indicator. And then my uh, standby airspeed indicator you know, should read zero or at or near zero. I move to my MPD, my multi-parameter display. Nothing to see here other than I'm making sure that uh, you know there's no cracks in the bezels or the, uh, the glass, etc. Move to my MFK. Real quick, I would check to make sure that the covers are down. Um, Really, there's nothing else to set here, just to make sure that all the keys are there and everything looks normal. 
I move to my armament control panel. Uh, the jettison switch covers should be down and lock wired, and then my master switch should be off. As I said in part two, if we had a gun installed, I would consider putting my uh, gun switch in the armed position. Now, I would have to turn the battery on momentarily. In order to get the bolt to come forward, I, I would have to have power. So what I would do is actually, on pre-flight, I would go ahead and turn the battery on, turn the uh, ACP master switch on, and then bring the bolt forward by putting the gun switch into armed, uh, knowing that there's no rounds chambered. So I would just let that bolt come forward, and then I would go ahead and leave it in the armed position, go ahead and turn the ACP master switch back off, and then turn my battery back off right quick. I got to turn the battery on to, on pre-flight to, uh, to check whether the anti-collision and the position lights and the landing light work. Um, so that's a good time to do that because the battery has to come on when I'm doing my pre-flight checks uh, on my walk around anyway. All right. We talked in detail in part two about setting my communication select control panel switches. So right now I would go ahead and, and set these. Uh, get my collective out of the way here so we can see. I note that I'm not in the remote position, so I'm going to put uh, my radio select switch in the remote, which transfers the functions to my collective control head. I make sure that my remote ICS switch for external communication hookup is off, and I can set my, my master volume. My SATCOM or ARC-231 control head, I don't necessarily care about at this point. Um, there's no, really nothing I can set here. I look to make sure that I'm in off. So right now it's in Z. Okay, we haven't enabled this function yet. So I wouldn't want to be in Z. Um, I think that's a spring-loaded. So Z means zeroize this this thing. So I, I definitely wouldn't want that. I think that one's locked out or spring-loaded, so you have to hold it in Z anyway. So it would naturally just rotate back to off anyway. But I want to make sure that this is off right now. So we haven't enabled this switch yet. Uh, this is not a radio that was used daily uh, for normal communication. It was kind of a specialized radio uh, to talk over long distances. So uh, we'll see whether we implement that or not. Uh, for my CMOS, I want to make sure I'm in auto. And again, this is called out separately in the checklist towards the end. So we'll see it again as a, as a separate detailed step in the run-up checklist. But I just know that these switches are going to be um, set uh, to auto and uh, safe right now. So that's where I can see, let's see, yeah, safe. Um, by the way, you know, if I bring this up, that's a lot of detailed steps that are covered in, you know, two or three steps on the um, pilot's checklist. Uh, so all of these things are expected to be done from memory, right? Um, there's uh, a subsequent section of the checklist. There's there's a chapter that starts with E for emergency procedures, and there's another one that starts with P, which I will show you in a moment, um, that are the detailed procedures. So anything that had the big stars next to it, if you recall, has a detailed procedure in the, uh, in the back section of this checklist. But for normal everyday operations, all this is just done from memory. So everything I just talked about, the pilot is just expected to know. All right. That finishes uh, instrument panel. No, no, it doesn't. Um, let me go back here. I got to look at my SCAS panel. Um, so my power switch should be off. Uh, and then I look at my, my pitch roll and yaw channels for the SCAS. These are spring-loaded switches that require electrical power to be held in the on position anyway. I just want to make sure that they appear normal. My force trim switch for starting the aircraft should be on. And my hydraulic system switch definitely should be on as well. Okay, then we move to flight controls and switches check and set. So the flow here is I check my pedals, no ratcheting, binding, freedom of movement, nothing uh, unusual that I detect. Uh, then I move to my cyclic. So I give it a, without hydraulic power, there's not a lot I can move. So, it, you know, it's probably an inch in each direction. Um, I can see that through the shadows there on the ground that my blades are correlating with what I'm doing. Um, and then I give my my switches, I kind of just hit each one to make sure that it doesn't get stuck in the down position. Okay, that's my cyclic. Then I move to my collective. So collective is going to come full up, full down. 
no rationing, binding, full freedom of movement, etc. Nothing mechanically wrong with it. I open up my throttle, make sure I get full throttle open, then I check my idle detent. So right there, I'm banging against the idle detent. That switch is, or button is actually working, preventing the throttle from being closed inadvertently. And then I press my idle detent and close the throttle all the way again. I check my collective control head switches. So my landing light at this point should be off. Everything else is spring loaded and my jettison cover on you know, obviously should be down. So that is flight controls and switches check and set. The last thing I'm gonna do if I haven't done it already, now the habit is when you climb in and put the key in, when you're first starting pre-flight, you take the key out of your pocket and put it in the, in the ignition, is you go ahead and turn it on. But this is just a dummy check. And I'm going to do that dummy, dummy check again right before I hit that start switch. It's super embarrassing uh, if, number one, you either forgot to put the key in or didn't pick it up from ops or whatever. Um, the start motor will turn, but the igniters will not pop. So you'll hear... Um, You'll hear the start motor turning just because you hit that start switch, but you won't get any sparks, so the engine won't start. And it's kind of embarrassing when you're trying to get the engine started and you just forgot to turn the key on. The other part of the dummy check is to make sure that the FADEX circuit breaker is uh, is on, which, you know, that's pretty easy. And then to make sure that my throttle, in fact, is at the idle. That's part of the start. Um, so those three things, you just kind of real quick in a matter of one or two seconds, you just check those right before hitting start. All right, that is flight controls and switches, check and set. So the next step would be bat switch to bat one. So before we do that, I just want to cover a couple items. Uh, it takes about 15 seconds for the MFDs to come up and the MCPUs to boot up. Uh, I'll get some electricity flowing. I'm only going to have cockpit on one side. So... As we talked about the essential bus switch over here on the 28-volt uh, um, power shared bus, uh, that isolates the right side of the cockpit only and only those things that are needed uh, either in an emergency or to get the aircraft started. So we don't necessarily want all this stuff over here uh, to be drawn amperage off the battery when we're trying to get the aircraft started. Uh, the batteries were used, you know, every day. Typically, you get one to two starts off a battery before it needs to be recharged. So um, there is provision for a second battery in the back. We never installed those because they weigh about 100 pounds, and that is 20 minutes worth of gas uh, for the KW or 300 rounds of 50 cal. So uh, if the battery voltage, which I will talk about in detail here in a minute, if the battery voltage isn't good enough, we would have brought a start card up. All right. So we'll jump right into turning that battery switch on. My eyes go down here. You can see the cockpit starts to come to life. And hopefully I hear some audio. Yep, there's my low rotor warning enunciation. So that's the first thing I hear. We talked about the ACK switch uh, or the recall acknowledge switch. So I'm going to ACK off that audio with one press. Okay, that silences the audio. Uh, I do need to talk about the caution and warning system. So we call it the CWA, the caution and warning systems. So in order of precedence, you have warnings, cautions, and advisories. Warnings, there's 11 of them, and they are things that are life-threatening or component critical. In other words, low rotor, high rotor, no rotor, meaning engine out, which you see here, uh, FADEC fail, low fuel pressure, uh, TGT over temp, transmission over torque, engine over torque. Those are conditions that if you don't react to them right away, uh, will have catastrophic consequences. Warnings are always displayed in the upper right hand of the MFD, except for there's a couple special ones like low altitude. Uh, if, if the throttle, well, actually it's called check throttle that comes up right in the center and only in one case. If your altitude falls below 400 feet AGL and the throttle is at idle, this is to prevent, we've had some accidents where uh, during practice auto rotations, particularly at the schoolhouse, uh, when you roll the throttle to idle to enter auto rotation, sometimes the instructors will forget to roll the throttle back open uh, to recover the aircraft prior to doing a, so we're not authorized to do full touchdown autos. Um, outside of the schoolhouse, but you do have to do practice auto rotations uh, when you're in the units. Um, 
So if you forget to roll that throttle open, you're going to the ground. So they implemented a special check throttle uh, message that would come up only in the event that you go below 400 feet with the throttle still at the idle position, meaning you're in auto rotation and, hey, buddy, you forgot to open your throttle. Go ahead and do that right quick. All the rest of them, the 11, uh, like I said, are, are those ones that you have to react to immediately. All warnings are accompanied by a uh, unique audio tone. So you just heard low rotor. That is the one hertz, meaning one signal or one tone per second uh, low rotor audio. The high rotor audio um, is accompanied by, so there's actually there's two or three of them that have the same audio because we only have a few options. So engine out, uh, stuff like TGT over temp um, have a three hertz. So that's what, what I would call a ding, 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 ding. That means three tones per second. Uh, low rotor RPM, you just heard. High rotor RPM is the three hertz. Engine out is the three hertz, etc. cetera. FADEC has its very own, very unique uh, sound. And it goes B do, B do, B do. And that you will see with either FADEC fail or FADEC manual. When you press this button to go into the manual mode, which is part of the run-up, you will hear that audio. Um, okay, that's enough about warnings. Warnings will always remain displayed. You can only silence the audio. You cannot get rid of the flag while you're in that condition. The rest of these down here are, are the cautions and advisories. Okay, so right here we can see we have nine cautions and two advisories. Uh, cautions are component failures or uh, something that the uh, there's a system on the aircraft that is uh, noteworthy that you should know about that if you don't do anything about it uh, can lead to damage or it's a failure that you should know about. Advisories are just like getting a text message. So advisories are accompanied by one tone. For instance, you get a BFT message. It just goes ding or your clock timer that you set to remind you to do a fuel check expired. Uh, it just goes ding. Um, a caution is accompanied by a one hertz or one per second tone. So it sounds like ding, ding, ding until you silence that audio with the acknowledge switch. Uh, you can make these go away by continually pressing the, as you see in the upper right there, uh, as I press this, it cycles through the cautions and advisories. And if I want to recall them, I flip that switch to the recall position and then I can go through. Now, this is something we need to fix. Um, instead of going recall and then down going through it, uh, I would continue to press it up. I don't know if that's worth fixing. I mean, it works either way. Uh, it's just makes my fingers itch because it didn't work quite the same way as in reality. And maybe I shouldn't say that. You guys would never know that, right? Um, so I just created more work for, for the boys at PC. Uh, so. Um, what you get on the startup here are completely normal indications. Obviously, our generators aren't online yet. AC and DC gen fail, so I would expect to see that. Low oil pressure engine, I would see that. Now, one that's missing is the rectifier. I talked a little bit about the uh, electrical system in part two. So <clears throat> just to cover it again real quick because it has some bearing on what I should be seeing here. Uh, AC gen fail. So the AC generator only runs when the engine speed is above 95%. So it will, uh, and that's because it just needs a certain RP RPM range to function. So I will see AC gen fail until my NR and NP are on the way up, rising above 95%. And then if you reduce the throttle, the gen will fail at 91% on the way down. And then so you say, well, I don't have any electrical power at that point. Well, it reverts to the DC gen system. Now, here's how it works. I should see next to this, and I can show you on the MPD here, if I were to select uh, display AC voltage and rectifier voltage. So once I have power, when I cycle through these various locations here, so right now I can see that on battery voltage, I have 24 volts. Uh, if I select these other things, this is AC voltage and the rectifier voltage, okay? So in normal operation, once the AC generator is online, the DC generator, otherwise known as the start motor, which starts the aircraft, uh, is not doing anything but providing 
battery recharge and as a backup source of power in the event of an AC generator failure. <clears throat> so clearly the AC generator supplies AC voltage, so I would see about 118 here once the AC gen kicks on. And rectifier, which is mechanically linked to the AC generator, is a component that supplies 28 volt DC in normal operation. So I would see about 118 here, and um, I, should, I should see 28 here uh, once my AC generator kicks online. If I turn the AC generator off, or if it fails for some reason, my backup source of electricity then becomes the DC generator, supplies DC power, and connected to the DC generator as the AC backup is something called the inverter. So if in the event my AC generator fails, this would go to zero, my rectifier voltage would go to zero. If I cycle down to rectifier load percentage, it would drop to zero, but my start gen load percentage, we gotta fix this label, would go very high, probably from five or 6% as it's just sitting there trickle charging the battery to 80 or 90% as all of a sudden it went, oh shit, I gotta pick up the electrical load for the other, for the rest of the aircraft because the AC gen failed. So it immediately switches over like a UPS that, uh, or an un uninterruptible power supply you have on your computer and the DC gen picks up the DC load and the inverter will pick up the AC load. In that event, the emergency procedure is, hey, I go to my AC gen switch, I reset the AC gen, so in normal operation, the switch would be on. Um, I would switch it off and switch it on again just to see if I can recycle it. And if, if I get, if it recycles, then great. Um, everything's back to normal and I don't have to do anything. If it doesn't recycle, then I should land as soon as practical at a place where I can you know, safely get the aircraft on the ground. All right, so what I should see here, all that was to explain that with AC gen fail, I should also see a caution that says rectifier fail. So I will address that with the team and we'll get that put in there just to have it look right. Would anybody but you know an actual pilot know that? Probably not, but like I said, we're doing our best to make this thing look absolutely correct. I also see DC gen fail. Um, inverter fail yeah, should be displayed as well. Uh, I'll have to double check that in the books. Uh, I don't know whether whether that one actually has a separate caution message. Like I said, low oil pressure engine is normal. Fuel boost fail is normal. Uh, number one, that switch is in the off position, and I talked about why we leave it in the off position in part two, so I won't cover that again right now. Pitch roll uh, disengage refers to the uh, SCAS system. And you can see five more messages. So if I want to read those five messages, I hit my recall act switch, inverter fail. Yeah, okay, so that should be uh, with the DC gen fail. I got to double check to make sure that the, the order precedence on these is absolutely correct. Low oil pressure transmission. Hey, that's also normal because the aircraft isn't on. SCAS disengaged, the power's off, right? And yaw disengaged. So these are probably not quite ordered correctly. Now, engine anti-ice on, why is that on, you say? Uh, I believe I talked about it in part two. Remember, that's a fail-safe switch, so it actually takes uh, power to turn that system off, right? So it's a spring-loaded valve, basically, that's on the uh, compressor section or the NG section of the engine, and when that valve opens, it takes some of the air that's going into the compressor section and redirects it to the inlet guide vanes on the compressor inlet. Um, if that component loses power, it's just going to open as a failsafe. So right now, because we don't have any power, uh, it's indicating on because it's in the open failsafe position. Once the aircraft gets started and I get the correct amount of DC power going there, that switch is going to close based on the switch position I have selected, which is anti-ice off. Um, and that switch is going to close, and I won't have that indication anymore. So that's why we see that right now. Okay, so I, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit talking about one of the uh, checklist steps as we go through all this. So let me just back up. We'll go to step number two after battery switch on to GPU connect as required. Um, so in order to start the aircraft, I have to have a minimum of 
no less than 21 volts. So if this indicates 20 or lower, I cannot uh, start the aircraft on battery power. Uh, so we have 24 right now, so we don't have to call for a start cart to uh, get us a little more juice to get the aircraft cranked. Caution, warning, and advisory messages and audio check. So that's all that stuff I just talked about. Moving on to the next page, FADEC auto manual switch, check auto. Okay, so I go up here. Yep, my FADEC system is in the auto position, which is what I want because that is what is actually computer controlling uh, the fuel control uh, to get the aircraft started. MPD test and set. So I go down to my MPD and I hold this switch in the on position and what I'm doing there is looking at all my vertical scales and all the segments on my on my digit displays to make sure that nothing erroneous is going on because I I would not want for instance you know an 8 that has four missing segments and I look at it and it looks like a 7 so uh, sometimes the vertical scale you know you may have one that's not working which is fine but basically you just want to make sure this is indicating properly um, I also, when I do that, I look at my VSIs. So same thing there. I make sure that my VSIs are, are fully functioning. Note the color bands. So, you know, as in just about everything in real life, uh, red is generally bad. Uh, amber is a caution zone. Green is the normal operating zone. Uh, so you see NP there all the way up to 100% is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, NP at 105 Actually, 107 is the upper limit. So um, the normal operating range is 100, and this is the transient range. Above 107, you start to get into damaging components, and that's what these little flags are. So these are the operating limits. I should note, when I set the engine speed, um, you saw that this went green from 0 to 100, uh, and this is the normal operating bench, not 97 to 100%. The way these work is that uh, it does not indicate that position so 100 does not illuminate from here to here until i reach 100 so it's a li it's a little bit counterintuitive 100 would actually be one chiclet above 100 because it has to reach 100 in order to latch that display segment and that if you note let me do it right right here you'll note that above uh, 100 it's actually amber so below 100% on the NR, the, the rotor speed, everything will actually blank out and as it goes into 100 to 107 there for transient operation, you'll only see one amber chiclet because that indicates we have reached 100 but we're not at 101 yet, which is the normal operating. So those segment lights that are below 100 will actually blank out, which is a little bit counterintuitive and it's an odd design feature, but I'll demonstrate that when I set the RPM once we get the aircraft started. All right, so that's MPD test and set. AUX circuit breaker panel, CMOS circuit breaker switch to CMOS. All right, so from there, I go back to my AUX circuit breaker panel and I turn my CMOS to CMOS. Control indicator CI power switch. This is, again, this is where I said, hey, we're going to do this separately as callouts in the checklist, but we've already looked at this. So it is, in fact, off. CMOS safe arm switch to safe and bypass auto switch to auto. Remember, we looked at that when we uh, set our switches during the uh, instrument panel instrument switches check and set. All right, SATCOM RT circuit breaker out. Why they do this now versus just doing it uh, on overhead circuit breaker circuits check and set? I don't know. Um, we have not implemented where you can actually pull these out. Is it important for gameplay? Not really. Uh, you know, it's just buttons you press just to pull them out. The reason we want to do that, honestly, I don't know why they would do that at this point after battery power coming on. Uh, it seems like it would make more sense to pull those if they need to be pulled prior to turning the battery switch on. So you got me. That's when I do not know. I'd, I'd have to dig into some manuals, etc. But it's not anything I ever thought about uh, in, in real life. Arc 231 fill panel power switch off. We already verified that also, right? That's down here. It's off. All right. Then we go to the uh, CPO side before starting engine. So this is what he was doing concurrently as I was running up the right side. So he's got his seat belts, his instrument panel. So remember, we talked about the uh, circled steps. 
So any any step that has a circle is is a duplicated task or normally a CPO task. So if I were to go to the uh, CPO side of the cockpit, what he's doing right there for instrument panel, instruments and switches, check and set, is setting his CSC panel and then his MFD control panel. So we should have two up, uh, sorry, two down, one up, one down here. The MMS rotary select switch knob should be in the off position. I want to make sure my MFD switches are set properly. My uh, laser arm standby switch is off, and that's really all I can do. My uh, my weapon aux control panel. Um, these are these are some kind of in-depth things here. Automatic low frequency gain limitation, uh, TIS integrate. That I'll talk about all that stuff when we get into the left side uh, procedures, which is not going to be for a long time. So don't be expecting that for a while. Going back to the uh, the pilot side. That leaves us at, so if the left seater is done, uh, flight controls, L2 mum circuit breaker set, remember they're off, I get up to, finally to engine start. <clears throat> uh, so I would quickly yell out fire guard. Uh, do we have one? No, we don't. Uh, which is not a problem, we can still start the aircraft. Uh, just pay a little extra attention. Rotor blades clear and untied. So I quickly check left, two clear right, or two clear left, and two clear right. Go back. Okay. Engine start accomplished. So here's my detailed procedure uh, to get the engine started. So what that means is there are pages in the P section of the uh, pilot's kneeboard checklist, which I'm going to click over that. And I apologize, this is a lot of clicks. Um, this is just the way I have this checklist set up. So I got to go through all the normal operations. Right now I'm in the emergency procedures section. And then I get to my P or detailed procedure section right there. All right. So a lot of stuff to talk about here. And I'm already at uh, 46 minutes. So stick with me, guys. Uh, all right. So the P section has detailed procedures for a lot of the from memory portions of the kneeboard checklist. So normally you would not be referencing this as part of the run-up. You just know it. But it's a... Uh, it's pertinent to talk about it now. So engine start as a detail procedure. We already, already checked the auto man, man switch. Now here's the things that I got to know. Do not attempt to auto a start if battery voltage is less than 21 volts. Okay, we got 24. I already talked about that. Why? That's because there's either not enough ignition source or enough, uh, just not enough amperage in the battery to turn the NG section blades to reliably get a start. And what would likely happen is as the fuel pump is dumping fuel in there, there's just not enough air going through, and you put spark to it, and you're just going to get a, uh, we call it a hot, hot start. Just all that gas is uh, starting to burn in the combustor section, but it has nowhere to go because the turbine blades can't spin fast enough. Okay, the start switch must be activated within 60 seconds of advancing the throttle. So that means this is a fail-safe procedure. So when I open this throttle to idle, uh, that tells FADEC, hey, I'm about to start. So basically, this is just an interlock, right? I open that throttle to idle. My key's in and on. My FADEC auto manuals or my FADEC circuit breaker switch is on. That's part of my dummy checks. Um, I have 60 seconds to hit that start switch to tell FADEC to manage the start. If I don't do it within 60 seconds, FADEC just says, okay, that was erroneous, and then it disables the, the auto start feature. And that's to protect some of the maintenance and ground crews you know, they would come in and either hook a wall power up to the aircraft. And it's not unusual for that throttle to get rotated. If uh, if the throttle was in the open position and you inadvertently, like your butt, hit the start switch there, you could feasibly start the aircraft, which wouldn't be good. So after 60 seconds, that's disabled. Um, all right. Then I would open the throttle to the idle detent. And that that's right before I'm ready to get the aircraft started. Now, here's the things I'm looking at as uh, I start the aircraft that I need to manage or at least pay attention to as, as we get started. Battery voltage may go below 14 volts during the initial start cycle. However, if it ever goes below 14 volts after 10% NG, I have to abort the start. The reason that is is because that tells me that battery is rapidly dying. So as I initially hit that start switch, there's a huge power draw as everything is you know, the, it's, the battery's trying to get the turbine blades to start. So just like anything, there's a, a surge in electrical draw. 
So my battery voltage right here is likely going to drop to 12, 13%. That's okay. As long as by the time I get to 10% NG, it's back above 14% or 14 volts rather. If it ever drops below 14 after I'm above 10% NG, I have to roll the throttle close and abort to start. That's to protect our cells from a hot start. And what happens is if it gets low enough, if it gets to 10.3 volts, uh, that's the minimum that the FADEC computer needs to operate. So if it hits 10.2, FADEC just goes bloop and it disappears. Um, and now I have nothing uh, controlling how much fuel is going in other than idle, which for starting is um, with not enough RPMs in the NG blades is not enough to keep the engine cool. So at that point, uh, most likely we're going to have a hot start. So that's why if it falls below 14 volts above 10% NG, my battery just got too weak to, to do the start, and I'm in danger of a hot start, so I got to abort. All right. If TGT does not begin to rise by 18% NG, I got to abort. So here's where I'm looking. Um, so everything is kind of correlated against the NG percentage, right? So my 14 volts by 10% NG, or after 10% NG rather, then I got to have a rise in TGT, which is right here. So that means I got to have the fire lit and going by the time I get to 18% NG. So NG, again, being the uh, gas producer turbine blade speed, those blades are spinning. If I don't have a fire by the time this hits 18%, which is really pretty fast, that's like 20,000 RPMs, uh, it just means that there's no fuel going in there and something is not right. So that's just a double check. Look, NG is spinning. It's not going to get any faster. 18 is about the max it can get on the start motor. Uh, if there's still no fire lit by that point, abort the start. Uh, all right, to prevent damage to the engine, uh, if it becomes apparent that temp limits will be exceeded before 50% NG is attained, abort the start. That's kind of obvious, right? So during the start sequence, my eyes are primarily tracking between here, watching how rapidly that fire is building, and correlating against my NG speed. So it, it goes rapidly back and forth. Uh, from experience, so that initial light off, I'm going to get a very rapid rise in TGT because you're going to have fuel dumped in there. It's going to ignite and it's going to go woof and it's going to go to about six, seven hundred degrees within a matter of a second or two. But I can tell at the rate that it's going whether it's a normal start or an abnormal start. If it's abnormal, I'm just going to close that throttle and abort to start. So that's what this is talking about. Uh, and then Lastly, after I have a start, to prevent engine damage, if the starter is still engaged at idle, uh, which is indicated by the start volts not dropping to zero after 50% NG, uh, I got to close the throttle and let's try it again. So what that is saying that the starter just refused to disengage. So 50% NG is my uh, cutoff limit for the combustion cycle to be self-sustaining. After 50% NG, FADEC is commanded, or FADEC commands the start motor to turn off. If it doesn't turn off, or if it if it refuses to disengage, that will be indicated by this not going to zero. So I would go ahead and close the throttle at that point. All right. I should note that my if my battery voltage goes below 20 volts, my MFDs will blank. So on a self battery start, that's normal. Like I said, when I first hit that that battery or that start switch. Uh, my voltage is probably going to drop to about 14, 13, 14%. My screen's going to blank out. Uh, it'll come back at around 17, 18 to 20% uh, when this will come back on. These instruments will be fine because this is what I need to, to start the, uh, to manage the start. But my MFD may blank out. And then for cold temp starts, which we don't have here today, I know that after I get the engine cranked, just like your car if you live in a cold environment, uh, your pressures will be very high. So my engine oil pressure and my transmission oil pressure will indicate probably pegged, uh, and I got to wait until they come into normal ranges before I can open the throttle. All right, so here's the procedure. I'm going to press the start switch. I'm going to check the battery volts, 14 or greater, by 10%. TGT increasing by 18%. Engine oil pressure by 20%. Rotor blades turning by 25%. And that's about how fast I do those callouts. And then I wait, start bolts. Decrease to near zero at 50% NG, and then NG stabilized at 63 to 65. At that point, I know I have a good start. 
So let's go ahead and uh, go through it. Um, let's see if I can back out a little bit here. All right, so I'm going to rotate my throttle to the idle position. My dummy checks, my keys in and on. I know my FADEX circuit breaker switch is on and my throttle is at idle. I now have 60 seconds to begin that start. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set my stopwatch just to time how quickly the start goes. And typically at five seconds, I'm going to go ahead and start that start switch. So 1,000, 2,000. All right, now my eyes go here. Uh, I have my Ryzen TGT. There's 10% NG. I have greater than 14 volts. I'm looking for a Ryzen TGT by 18%, which I have. Engine oil pressure by 20%. Now we're approaching 25, and there's blades turning, which I can see by the shadow. So it looks like a good start. So we've hit our peak. TGT comes back down, and then it's, we would have a secondary, and it would peak again. So now I'm just waiting for 50% NG for my start volts to drop to zero. Boom, it did. I know my starter is disengaged. My TGT is stabilizing. Now all I'm doing is waiting for NG to stabilize at 63 to 65%, indicating a good start. And it looks like our NG is stabilized at 64.5. The starter is, in fact, disengaged. We got a good start. All right. From there, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the restart procedure due to a low voltage abort, nor an alternate warm start procedure. Uh, and here's all the things. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I wish I'd a uh, so you guys could read these while I was talking through it. Um, here's where it. Sorry. Uh, here's where it references the 10.3 volts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, let me click back to my normal procedure. Sorry, and this just is what it is. So I got to go back to N7. Okay, so we got the engine started. Uh, engine start accomplished, and now step four is. Uh, engine oil pressure and uh, transmission oil pressure check within limits. So those are all in the green bands, right? My pressure and temperature and my pressure and temperature. So everything appears to be pretty normal. And then I go to the uh, engine run up. So real quickly, this would happen very rapidly after I check my engine oil pressure and temperature. So it's DC gen to DC gen, AC gen, essential bus, fuel boost. GPU disconnect, since we don't have it connected today, I don't need to worry about that. IFF uh, circuit breaker, particle separator, and then the filter bypass switch. All right, so in real time, the way that would, the way that would look, uh, I would go ahead and come up here and just call out. All right, I'm going to do DC gen, AC gen, essential bus, fuel boost. Go back to the rear here. Particle separator. IFF and then come forward to check my EBS my EBF uh, bypass indicator and remember this would be illuminated if there is such a pressure differential between the filter and what the engine is trying to suck in that that sensor is being tripped so I'm just checking to make sure that hey nothing untoward before I roll the throttle all the way up to 100% um, that nothing is going on that would you know, cause me concern. So that's what I'm looking at there. All right. Go to the next page. PC DTSV mission load as required. Notice this is a circled step. Okay, this is where we would say uh, between the co-pilot and the right seat pilot um, that we would uh, go ahead and break off on the checklist. So this would be step number one on the left seater's uh, cockpit run-up side. So let me show you that real quick. So on the engine run-up, notice this is step number one circled. And if I go back, so right here, step number nine on the right seater side is circled. 
and they are duplicated tasks. BCS, DT, DTSV, mission load as required, it's the same thing. So this is where I would say, hey, let's go ahead and break off on the checklist. And the CPO would start on his side of the checklist, which is conduct a nav align, survivability equipment, avionics configure, MMS startup, video recorder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's doing honestly uh, what takes several more minutes to do. I'm going to be done with the run up in about 30 seconds. Uh, at that point, we can, based on crew coordination, kind of split some more tasks because it takes um, several minutes to configure the radios, configure the weapon systems, configure the nav system, etc. I'll show you what we do to load the mission real quick because the oftentimes the uh, right seater would go ahead and pick up this task. So as I, uh, I lost it. There we go. So PC DTSV is the data card. So before I can really do anything, I got to load my mission. So I'm going to go to data loader and the default password to get into here is I got to go to my keyboard. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Enter. Okay. Now I get into uh, my mission card, which I don't know if I can get my head around that far uh, to see it. Let me see if I can go to the, the left seat. Okay, so the, the mission data card is in this little receptacle right here. There's three of them. There's a map card, there's a, um, a mission data card, which has radio configurations, a lot of other stuff. The map card just has the background maps that we would use on the HSD. And then the third card is kind of the engine data recorder. So it just has a continuing half hour loop of recording everything the engine is doing. That's only the maintenance test pilots can use that. Um, so going back to the, the pilot's seat here. All right, so this allows me to get into the data card. So I would go ahead and load a mission. So I would hit test. I want to deselect initial position. If I, so everything that's boxed is what's going to be pulled off the data card and put into the aircraft. Uh, if I don't deselect initial position, um, it's going to overwrite what the air, where the aircraft thinks it is. So this could be a problem, for instance, if we came from the US, uh, we loaded the aircraft on boats to deploy somewhere, um, and we unloaded in, let's say, Kuwait or uh, Ukraine or wherever. Uh, and on the next run up, if at, through maintenance checks, we will have started the aircraft several times, and most likely the nav align process will have found where on Earth the aircraft is. If I overwrite that position with initial position, and that information happens to be like at home base in the in the U.S., uh, it's going to confuse the aircraft because you're telling it at that point, "Hey, you're at Fort Bragg, North Carolina," but the aircraft already knows that it's in Ukraine. So at that point, it kind of jukes up the nav system and it could be a problem. So I always deselect initial position first. Com, waypoints, laser code, and weapons data, I want to load in, right? So then I hit load. Now everything is loading. And I will uh, I'll most likely do this again when we talk about uh, detailed procedures uh, to get the aircraft run up. But this is kind of, I can't do anything uh, until this is uh, configured. Bringing up my checklist again. All right, so we have PCS DTV. Um, PC DTSV mission load is loaded. My nav align initiate as required. This is also a CPO task. What he's doing here, I'm going to go to my initial page um, and then go to my nav align page at L1. Okay, notice I have four satellites in the clear. So that's good. I'm picking up all the uh, satellites I can get. So it needs at least three to have a position and it needs four for uh, for the best accuracy. Um, notice this is no longer boxed. So right after I, I've been talking for more than four minutes, it takes four minutes for this process to happen. Uh, during that process, auto will be boxed. If I go to my VSD page here, uh, I will not have a present position here. I will not have a pitch ladder because as the nav align process is happening, 
the gyros in the aircraft are spinning up, they're comparing themselves to reference data, uh, the EGI is capturing satellites and finding itself, and all those systems are working together, and that takes four minutes. Um, I won't have a pitch ladder prior to that because that runs off the, the gyros. Uh, I won't have a present position until the nav line is complete. So what that means to you is, oh, here's, we got to fix this, so I can't get back to my initial page. So this button here, as I press it, I should be able to get back to that top menu page, which allows me to get back uh, to my uh, selecting my nav align page. I wonder if I can, no, I can't get there. Yeah, so I, I'm going to break the video off here because we're going to have to get this feature fixed before I can really talk about anything else because I have to be able to get back to my top menu page to get back to the nav align page to the uh, weapons configuration pages, etc. Uh, so here's an initial button right here too. Okay, um, these should be duplicated. So I guess we can just kind of, I'll, I'll see uh, why, yeah, so uh, as I'm thinking about it, uh, there may be a reason we didn't do that. Uh, at any rate, I guess I can keep talking. So I'm back to my initial page, so my nav align uh, now, because the aircraft has found itself, auto is no longer boxed. So inside of four minutes, if you were to go to initial and nav align, and then you would see auto here. And you would not see your present position on the HSD, and you would not see a pitch ladder, etc. Uh, okay, so that's nav align initiate. Really, you're just checking it. Radar alt check. Um, and this is where I'll, I'll go ahead and... I'll, I'll go ahead and break it off here, and then we will... I'll, I think I'm going to go ahead and, uh, since we're at an hour six, uh, I'll make this part four as we do uh, a run-up from after engine start from idle to 100%. So uh, look for part four in a few days, or if I get to it later today. i got a long weekend, so I might get to it. Um, so enjoy.